Thanks, Hal. <clears throat> and mercifully for you all, I don't have, I don't have slides. Um, but I do have comments on, on uh, two really superb uh, presentations um, and then some um, more general comments as, uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> first with um, Miguel, he uh, really um, tells us to ask, ask the right questions and, um, <clears throat> and be sure when we, as we compare observational to uh, studies to randomized trials that we uh, are comparing apples to apples and oranges um, uh, to oranges. And of course this should go on in design as well. So uh, we need to look at the right questions and we need to look at the right types of, of, of analysis. And if you don't, you will go astray, but there may be opportunities to rethink that, uh, that later. That's, that, that's very important. Uh, Ellie's uh, um, uh, talk was also very, very provocative and, and very interesting about how we can general, generalize the results of randomized trials and how we can put them in the context of observational studies and hopefully say something uh, a little bit, a, a little bit um, uh, broader. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example um, of how this has been used, how people have actually done this without, without an analytic framework, but just sort of have done it. And that's in taking results of uh, randomized trials uh, comparing um, uh, uh, conservative uh, versus an invasive strategy in acute coronary syndromes. The randomized trials have, had, have generally had a population's uh, age of, of about uh, 62, and not entirely, but generally consistently they've shown a benefit of an, invas an invasive strategy, and that has taken over. That's what, that's what we do for acute coronary sy syndromes. I'm not talking about ST segment elevation MI. I'm talking about people who have unstable angina and uh, non se segment elevation MI. We generally take them to the cath lab, and if, and if there's anatomy suitable, we, we uh, uh, revascularize them. And that's been consistently shown in randomized trials to, to uh, lower the incidence of, uh, of, of events. And that's worked out in observational studies as well. It's worked out in observational studies of, of, of younger groups, and so we feel good about that, and we, we generalize the results. But how about in older populations? We're doing this in people in the, in, who are octogenarians, where we don't really have randomized tr uh, trial data. So, so can we do that le uh, leg legitimately? Can we uh, uh, say, well, it works in randomized trials in the young, and, and sort of the not so young, and it works in the observational uh, studies in the young and the not so young. Can we really generalize it to, to um, uh, the elderly? And, and there I would have to say not so, not, not so fast, because what's the problem? And Ellie said it. You'd have to assume that the confounders are the same, but they may be wholly different. They may be wholly different in that the people we take to the cath lab who are, who, who are elderly may be the less sick elder, elderly. Well, we're excluding the sick elderly from taking to the cath lab, and so we're biasing the population in ways where we're not measuring those, uh, those confounders. And I think that that remains an open uh, uh, question today. But I, what I like about um, what Ellie did is she provided a framework for us on how to um, uh, think about this. Now, populations in randomized trials may be very, very, very narrow. They may be narrow, those, uh, those in the population. And then we have problems of, of, of generalizing them. But suppose we're off to, off to the extreme. And I think that, that really the problem of, not, of, of, <coughs> of um, how to treat pa the elderly with, with uh, acute coronary syndromes is one of those um, uh, examples. Let me give a couple of other examples um, uh, briefly. What do you do when the results of, of observational studies and randomized trials really don't match? And a good example of this is bare metal stents versus drug eluding stents in randomized trials and observational studies. It was a very large observational study with hundreds of thousands of patients from the N NCDR, and it showed a survival advantage drug eluding stents, but no difference in, in repeat revascularization. Well, the randomized trials showed completely the opposite. They showed an advantage of, <coughs> of <coughs> drug eluding stents for revascularization, but not for mortality. What are you going to believe? In this setting, I think that the, uh, the randomized trials trump the observational studies. As was said this morning, size does not, does not over, overcome bias, and the biases, the reasons to believe in comparison to judge types of stents that the biases were, were large and, not, and that, that they could not, were not properly accounted for. Now, suppose they match. And, and an example of that was our study uh, and also Mark Lackey's um, uh, uh, set of stu uh, studies looking at, at coronary surgery um, versus P PCI, which has shown a mortality benefit generally of, of uh, uh, PCI, of, sorry, coronary surgery compared to PCI. And they're the observational studies and, <coughs> and the uh, randomized trials pretty much match. 
So that gives you confidence in, in the decision. Well, one of the nice parts about that would be because you have a wider distribution in, in the observational studies may, and you have a lot more patients, you can look more deeply into subgroups. Well, then we have to watch out for that, that, that problem that's raised by, by, by Ellie. If you start looking in, this, in, in the subgroups, you better make sure that you have good control of those, of those confounders because they may, be, they may be different in the subgroups from, from the population as, uh, as a whole. Now I'm going to uh, stop uh, with two more things. One, my favorite observational uh, study, and that was a, uh, um, a contract from the FDA to the NCDR to study uh, closure devices. So this was built on top of, of a reg ongoing registry, added on a little bit of, of, of prospective data, but it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't randomized, and that was to look at safety. So you heard from, from, from Rob about um, you, you want to start out with efficacy in the randomized trials, and that worked great for the closure devices. They all will get you up and ambulating fa faster after, a after a procedure, but are they safe? The randomized trials were all very small and couldn't look at safety. So by coupling a, an observational study on top of a, of, uh, of a registry, we were very rapidly able to put together 60,000 patients, allowing us to, to, to look at vascular complications. And we found for one of the devices an odds ratio for vascular complications of four. Four. Odds ratio of four. Enough to be believable, not really reason to think a lot of, of uh, treatment selection uh, bias. And that device was off the market within a couple of weeks. To me, that was really one of the triumphs of comparative effectiveness um, uh, research. So what are, what are registries really good for at the, end, at the end of the day? And Rob also said this, what registries are really good for is for quality of care and, and uh, uh, adherence. But they're also being used to compare outcomes. And that's where I think that there's, uh, there's uh, real danger. Talk about multiplicity when you're looking at thousands of, uh, of providers. The real plea here is, is for registries, coupling them with the EHRs, and for better quality of data. I think that's the most important thing. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Bill.